I never had a problem hitting. I had a problem living. That's our guest, Daryl Strawberry, power hitting outfielder with the big smooth swing, star for the 1986 world champion, New York Mets. He also played for the Dodgers, San Francisco Giants, and the Yankees. He hit 335 home runs and had exactly 1,000 RBIs. That over a 17-year career, he was en route to Cooperstown and the Baseball Hall of Fame when his career was derailed by substance abuse problems. His new book, Not a Baseball Book, written with addiction experts, Don't Give Up on Me, Shedding Light on Addiction. Welcome, Daryl. Honored to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me this morning. And um, I, as I told Ron Darling once when I interviewed him, the 86 Mets were one of the last times that um, I, I was in love with baseball. At Once the steroid era uh, came, I lost a little bit of interest. So uh, thanks for all the action then. And, and congratulations, if I got it right from your book, you've been sober for 12 years? 14. They kind of mis- misprinted that, but that's okay. 14. That's even better. And this is not... <laughs> This is not a baseball book. Tell us briefly to start off uh, what your purpose is here. Well, the whole purpose is is our group that came together, myself and the doctors, and John Picciano, who's the CEO for Overthorpe and the Dell Strawberry Recovery Centers, and Ron Doc, who is a certified addiction counselor. Uh, we worked together helping people, and uh, Ron brought me together with this group a couple of years ago, and they wanted to do treatment centers, and you know, just from my story and Ron's story, who worked with the Yankees uh, and was a counselor for like 16 years, uh, we just thought it was time to write this book with the epidemic that's going on across America with uh, opiates and heroin addiction. There's so many young people losing their life because of no education on, on addiction. Um, I think what, what has happened is uh, prescription drugs have entered in and entered into their lives, and, and it's destroying them, and we're just really trying to uh, bring about awareness and educating the stigma on addiction has been people are weak and it's not it's a disease it's an illness of the mind and and if we can get back into the schools and, and educate people um i've been reaching out to the president um trump to try to get on his team program to, to really educate people so he can allow us to get back in the schools and help some of these young people to avoid the pitfalls like i did and many others doing great work we're going to dive into that uh coming right up let me ask you um uh, do you think a hundred percent you'd be a Hall of Famer without without the drugs? Oh, no question. I mean, I think you know, coming. I was I was already active drinking when I was young, thirteen, fourteen years old, and smoking marijuana, which a lot of kids end up in marijuana maintenance and think it's nothing wrong with it. But eventually, it stops working, and then you lead to other things. Uh, when you're broken inside and you're never healed inside. Uh, because of the fact that my father was an alcoholic and used to beat the crap out of me and said I'd never amount to nothing, and i go on to be a baseball player. But I, like I tell people all the time, it was my pain that led me to my greatness, and it was my greatness that would in, end up leading me to my destructive behavior. Uh, of course, I, baseball, I was a baseball player, but it never allowed me to be a man because of the hurting inside and never dealt with that part. And I just... I'm like everybody else. I just cover it up. You know, my, my feelings were covered up with alcohol, drugs, and just to escape from the fact of who who am I. The uh, one other question related to potential: Should the '86 Mets have won um, more World Series if the team hadn't sort of, uh, I guess, moved too close to the edge of partying, et cetera? Well, of course, there's no question about it. We're we're a great group of guys. I love all those guys. We're wonderful. To play with what we did uh, coming into New York and, and turning that franchise into a winner was incredible. Davey Johnson, Frank Cash, and the general manager, uh, they built the team, and we had we had everything we needed to have. You know, I just think our lifestyles was just a little bit way out of control um, <laughs> from time to, from time to time. And I think if we'd have slowed down and got some rest at night, we would have probably ended up being more successful and winning more championships. You know, of course, we lost in '88. We should have won. That year, but we lost to the Dodgers, and they go on to beat the Oakland A's in that series of the championship. Yeah, and in fact, I, I sometimes wonder if that edge uh, that gave you the swagger um, was the same edge on the negative side, so uh, whether you would have won without that edge. But let me ask you this, because I heard this years ago when, when the problems emerged, and Frank Cashin, who built the team, said that he felt, and the Mets felt a little guilty, that they had stolen your youth, and he was referring to Dwight Gooden and yourself. Um, by putting you under the pressure so early uh, in your in your lives, what do you think of that? Uh, Frank Cashin was a remarkable person and an incredible um, 
man who had uh, great wisdom and insight, and he really didn't want us to be in the big leagues at that uh, young age. He didn't want me to come up at 21, and he didn't want Dwight to come up at 19. He felt like we needed to be more seasoned as a person down in the minor leagues to grow into you know, who we are and everything because he, he just didn't feel like we had – had that growth just yet of, of becoming a man, especially playing in a place like New York and, and then being under the spotlights. And he always was cautious about that because I think he remember a young player like Tim Leary had got hurt and hurt his arm. He was a phenomenal pitcher and, and he never recovered from it. And I think Frank was a little worried and concerned about myself and Dwight coming to New York and, and having to stand and play under that kind of pressure. I don't think he was never concerned about our baseball ability. Mm-hmm. I think he was concerned about more of our life and how would we live? How would we handle being in a place like New York City? I told you what a great guy he was. He wasn't just looking to exploit your talent. All right, tell us uh, the book, Don't Give Up On Me. Uh, tell us what you mean exactly by that. Well, it, it means don't give up on anyone just because they have a substance abuse problem. Um, something's wrong, some trauma, some brokenness inside has happened to a person to allow a person to go so far and escape and get uh, down into the depths of, of, of addiction. Uh, addiction is a illness uh, of the mind. Anything that alters the mind is going to make you ill, and you just don't know what 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 results are going to turn out in a person's life. And if it wasn't for my wife Tracy and Ron Doc, people like that that were there for me, that never gave up on me, um, even through the hard times, it was some really hard times. And mine was public, um, and it was some really hard times that I had to overcome things. Uh, to be able to get back on the other side of life. But they didn't give up on me, and that's the importance of family. Uh, don't give up on your loved ones. You uh, you could love them right where they're at, but you don't have to tolerate it, but just don't give up on them. Just keep believing that their life can change, they can recover, um, somebody can help them, somebody can educate them about addiction, and they can get up on the other side of it. And and it also refers to, to your mother always believing in you, right? My mother, yeah, always believing in me that I would do something great and mighty different than baseball. I see most people think, well, it was baseball. You know, baseball was just a platform, but it wasn't my life. And my mother always believed that I was going to have an impact, a global impact on people's lives. She said she always believed that God was going to use me mightily to do something different to help other people. And, and I'm just grateful, and I'm grateful for, like I said, my wife, Tracy, who never gave up on me, who was one that helped me turn my life around and find my purpose in life. Let me ask you this. So the, in the book, it refers to addiction as a runaway train, and, um, and, and people feel it's shame to get help. And recently, Craig Carton related to gambling. How hard and how important is it to ask for help to stop the train? It's, it's very hard um, because we're, we're people of you know, pride. You know, we don't want people to think um, uh, we're weak or anything like that, but it's not a weakness, and that's what people don't understand. Addiction is very powerful in all areas, gambling, sex, porn, um, drugs, alcohol. It's real, um, and it's really necessary for one to get help uh, and to be able to go through some serious counseling for a long time, not a short time, but for a long time, um, to get the mind well again because the mind has to heal. And it will heal if we allow ourselves not to pick up and not to use. Uh, it's just a process that you have to go through, and it's a struggle. It's not an overnight miracle. I think too many people think, well, they should be well, or why are you taking drugs? Why are celebrities taking drugs and they have all this money? Money don't make you happy. You know, money just makes you buy stuff and live comfortable, but it's not going to make you happy. It's not the answer to what's going on inside you. And we all look great on the outside, but what about the inside? What What has happened in your life to make you um, not like yourself or dislike yourself? And I see it. So much with, with what we're dealing with today, and that's why so many kids are, are dying because they don't like themselves. I've sat with them in treatment center, and they just said, I really don't like my life. I started smoking marijuana at the age of 13, 14, just like you, and I went from that to pills and went from that to heroin, and you know, I just rather have drugs you know, to not feel. So um, we just need to be able to encourage people. What's important is to, to truly love someone because their life matters. And, um, in fact, I w- we'll talk now, now about that constant emotional pain because I'm sure people will be surprised at the self-hatred you had. You thought you were ugly. And it's not really the bright lights and bright city, is it, that brought you down. It's a troubled youth, and, and, and you, you refer to the monster. Tell us a little bit about, about the, the, the abusive nature of growing up. Well, the abuse was, was real. It was physically, it was 
you know, my father was an uh, alcoholic, and then he was abusive of, of beating. You know, that's all he really knew. And, you know, made you take off your shirt and lay across the bed and beat you with an extension cord. And you just didn't understand that. And you felt like, well, I'm, I'm not worth anything. He didn't love me. He never saw me play Little League or anything and never gave me a hug or said, great game or anything. And uh, that hurts. I mean, that's, that's, rejection is so real. And I think so many people feel rejected by loved ones uh, because of something that's happened in their life. And we don't know what happened to people's life. Abuse is real. You know, when I sat in my treatment center and sit with young girls and, and talk to them and they've been molested by uncles and 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 stepfathers and stuff like that. That's real stuff. You know, those, those are scars. Those are real scars that's left in people. And if we don't, if they didn't never deal with them, of course they're going to use to cover up the pain that they're in. Um, and you talk about this, this, this need for emotional relief. It's up and down. How did you finally get to peace? Well, you have to have a spiritual awakening in your life. And I think what's happened in our society more than anything, faith has been removed from what's important, faith in God and, and, and kids and educating kids that you know, God is love to them and, and being able to have faith to believe um, something different and something greater than yourself has been removed. So I, I think finding that has made a, a, such a joy and a relief inside of me, but has brought happiness and peace with inside of myself where I no longer have a desire to have all these other things, all these worldly things to make me feel good. I, I think people get so consumed with so much worldly stuff and they think they're happy but they're really not because i was I, I had everything and i wasn't really happy i had plenty of money i had homes cars i still was never happy i wasn't happy until i found faith and found peace with inside of myself and found out you know i was created for something greater than just what people believed i was as a baseball player how important were mentors to you i know you mentioned keith hernandez on the team but you know but mentors overall they're they're good. I mean, they're 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 important. You know, but being able to have see when we had when I saw Gary Carter and you know Keith was a good mentor as a player. But when I saw Gary Carter as a player as a man, uh, I wanted what he had because that was incredible. Because he was a man of faith, loved God, loved his family. Uh, he never wavered. He didn't live uh, a wild life. He, he respected us. He loved us. He didn't he didn't judge none of us. But he just never lived a life outside of what was important. And, and that's what life should be all about. I mean, I, I get to experience that today. I'm just so grateful, you know, to be able to have a teammate like that, that I saw that, that knew that you can live a different way because a lot of times you don't think you can live a different way because you're at the highest level of playing professional sports and this is the way it is. Well, that's not true. I mean, there is life after baseball. And we're talking with Daryl Strawberry, of course, the Mets uh, baseball star, and he's got a book with experts on the problems of addictions. Um, do you need to hit bottom? It, it's pretty amazing. I think people will find that, that, that at the bottom you were found behind a dumpster um, cons- uh, w- covered in filth and uh, almost wanting to die. Yeah, it, it's a bottom. If you continue to use, that's what it has to be. A, a bottom has to, has to come. Um, if your bottom never come, you may die. I mean, when you look at all the celebrities that have died through overdose is because they never hit a bottom and they just kept going and they believed they were okay. And the latest last one was Prince. He, he didn't have to die the way he did. Um, I'm taking the opiates, you know, I just, uh, you don't have to die like that. You can't recover. Uh, so yeah, my bottom was behind dumpsters and my bottom was in drug houses and shooting dope and smoking crack and my wife, Tracy pulling me out. Uh, just, those were some bottles where, where I just could never imagine myself going, but that's where addiction will take you. It will take you to a place, and it will drown you. Uh, amazing honesty and, and forthrightness here, uh, to your credit. Uh, and, you know, one thing that I got, it hit me, is eight-time All-Star, four-time World Championship, millions of dollars, and yet it sounded almost like you found most freedom uh, and to love yourself when you were in prison with nothing. Yeah, I found, when I found myself with nothing, that, that was, those are places where when I started to find myself with the empty, emptiness of life with nothing, those were probably the best moments of my life because I didn't have to really deal with people anymore. Because when you don't have the stuff no more and don't have the money no more, everybody's gone. <laughs> so, yeah, they're only there when the ride is good. And, you know, now that I, I live a different life and my ride is different and 
you know, I'm in ministry, I'm an uh, evangelist and travel and preach all over the world. You know, people don't want to be around that. You know, they want to be around the old me, but he, he no longer lives. He's dead. <laughs> There's a new, a, part of me, so. a new Daryl Strawberry. Tell us now, uh, what are the Daryl Strawberry Recovery Centers and your current mission on that? Well, it's a residential 28-day program, and we'd like for them to be longer. You know, if we have to keep them longer, we keep them longer to, to help people understand substance abuse and help people understand uh, that their life matters and, and bring bring about corrections. Uh, people got to be willing to go there and, and, and do the work, and that's what I try to tell them. Every, you know, I've had so many kids in and out of our treatment center and so many that OD'd because I kept telling them, if you don't do the work, you will die. It, this, this is not a game. Drugs will kill you. And I think a lot of times we don't think the reality of it's going to, I'm going to be the one. And, and for the grace of God, there go I. I should be dead. But, you know, here it is. I get a chance to spare and save some lives now. And, and that's the mission. That's the urgency of waking up every day is to help someone else that's still suffering. And, and you feel at the end that this, this is all much more important than the fact that you were one of the greatest baseball players ever. Yeah, this is more important. You know, baseball is a game. Uh, I can tell you what's going to happen. Somebody's going to win. Somebody's going to lose. Somebody's going to win the championship. Somebody's going to lose it. And in life, you only get one shot at this. And we need to try to help people make the best shot of regardless of, of their condition. Um, God loves them, and it's important that we love them too, and we make sure that they know that they are loved and they're not a mistake. Uh, their life is important, so um, that's you know that's the mission of waking up every day. You know, it's, you know, shedding light on addiction is dot com is the, is is the website that we have. So uh, I just recommend that parents pick up this book because you never know when your child is going to uh, make your own decision and get a prescription. Because if he does, I tell him don't allow your child to get a prescription, please. When I speak, don't because once they get one, it's going to alter their mind. It's going to be a different kid. Um, let them take Tylenol like we used to back in the days, and tell them to lay down the pain. It will go away, but take a Tylenol or ibuprofen or something until you feel better. And uh, you talk about your mother never giving up on me. I think somehow she's uh, looking down, very proud of you. Tremendous work you're doing. The book is Don't Give Up on Me, Shedding Light on Addiction, and it's out October 16th, but you can pre-order it now at Amazon and places like that. You can go to strawberrycenter.com to learn more about the recovery centers and strawberryministries.org for Daryl's website. Daryl, thanks for giving us a few minutes, and keep up the great work. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks so much for taking time out.